of migration and settlement of communities in Eastern Africa. Are we together there? Now, uh, listen, we said this was the effect, number one is language and the culture. The bigger, the communities learned the culture and the language of the neighboring community. So what's that, right? Uh, if Bantu were neighboring nylons, Bantu learned the language of nylons. Also, they learned the culture of nylon. For example, Bantu and the nylons learned circumcision from Hushites. Are you together there? Then you find that Bantus and the nylons, they share names like Maina. Number two, there was increased trade. Things that were produced by Bantu were sold to nylons and were also sold to Kushites. Things produced by Kushites were sold to Bantu and also were sold to nylons. Number three, there was hostility. Wadui, enmity, hostility. When a community was migrating and it met another strong community, the strong community used to beat the weaker community and take all the livestock. Are you together? It also used to adopt most of the people and the ladies of that weaker commu community. That thing brought hostility. The other community would not trust a community that was beaten them. Are you get what I'm saying? Let's say Bantu were thoroughly beaten by Kushites and all their ghettos were taken by Kushites. Do you think Bantu will ever trust them? No. So they will stay with a certain enmity. That certain enmity is now what we call hostility. hostility. The best of it is education, because the modern education has gone reducing all those things. Eh? Now, from there we add assimilation. Assimilation. What is assimilation? Is when a strong community absorbs the weaker community. Is when a weaker community change their way of life and follow the way of the stronger community. It is when a weaker community will stop speaking their own language and start using the language of the stronger community. Are you getting what I'm saying? You are 100 people. Bantu, like let's say, Wachon. 100 group of Wachon. They are now in Rift Valley where there is one million colleges. Will those 100 Chonies continue speaking Chon? No. Because they'll be absorbed because the moment they step out of their homes, the person they're speaking to is using another language. The children who are like you, you will grow up speaking the language of the other community. So with the time, you will find yourself speaking the language of the other community, doing like the other community, eating like the other community. Assimilation is done. Point number five is adoption of new technologies. Adoption of new technologies. For example, Bantus and Nilos learned smelting. What is smelting? It's using fire to eat some stones to make metal. Eating some stones to make metal. It's a stone. We have some stones, when you eat them, you, make, you get what? A metal. So, these Kushites 
learned how to do smel smelting and to make panga, to make arrows, and to make spe spears. Nylos used spears and the arrows for hunting and fighting their enemies. Bantus used the panga and the hose and the jembes to do cultivation. Are we together? So that is what? Adoption of new technologies. What have I said about new technologies? Huh? What have I said about new technologies? What have I said about assimilation? Mm. You are not listening. You're making noise, and then now you cannot answer that simple question. My friend, what have I said about assimilation? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Is when the smaller community will change their way of life, the way of doing things, and start doing it like the larger community. We see the smaller community has been assimilated, has been absorbed. So, sir, so, technologies you have said about what? Who can explain to me what I have said about technologies? Yes. So Kushites were the initial community that knew about making metal things, right? Yes. Only the community that knew how to use those stones to make metals. But Bantus and the Nylots learned from them. Nylots used those metals to make arrows and the spears for hunting and fighting enemies. Bantu used those metals to make jempe and the pangas for cultivation. Lastly, is effect of physical picture. And this one you can write so you can write it. Effect of physical picture. In social studies, we have physical features. These are the natural features that we are given by God and that are found on the earth surface. This is the nature of the earth surface. Some part of the earth surface are depressed, filled with water like all oceans. Others are seas. Others are hills. Others are mountains. Others are Lakes, others are empty valleys. Are you together there? All those are physical features. Now, when people, when those people who are migrating reach these physical features, the physical features themselves change the people. The physical features force the people to change their way of life and they join new way of life. For example, Luo. Luo 
wa pastoralis. Luo wa pastoralis. Pastoralis, pastoralis. Right? Luo wa pastoralis. They change to fishermen due to what? Fishermen due to presence of leg, presence of leg, Victoria. Victoria provided plenty of fish. Therefore, Luo enjoyed more on fishing than keeping livestock. So that is one influence. <laughs> Number two, island nylons. Island nylons. Change to farmers. Change to cultivators. From pastor, from pastoralism, because they settled in the islands of Kenya. They settled in the islands of Kenya. Kenya. So. Initially, all nylons were pastoralists. But when they reached in areas with high rainfalls, good climate, fertile soil, they now change from following cows and they started growing crops. And that was influenced by what? Physical features. That was number six, the last one. So, what's up? But now, and those were the six effects of migration and settlement of people. Now, let us talk about unity of language groups. Unity of language groups in Eastern Africa. Learners, I have said, well, in, among these effects, there was some negative effect, isn't it? Like where people are fighting, those are negative effects. Where people are getting assimilated, that is a negative effect. Where there is hostility, what would I want to do? What would I want to how to say, I think you hear those, that story of Keto Rasling in Rifty Valley. Now that's the thing we are talking about. Uh, with the time, people have come to open up their minds and realize there is need for unit. There is no need to stay hostile with another community. Are you together there? And that one brought what? Brought unit of language growth in Eastern Africa. This thing was mostly cultivated by education. If I can look in this class, I find people from different language groups. What? With that simple, with that simple sampling, eh, you find our class is comprising all language groups. And we stay, we stay at peace. We stay at peace. In fact, nobody knows where your, your friend is coming from. Not unless your friend tells you 
Ama Kamba, Ama Lua, Ama Ria, Ama this, Ama this. Isn't it? What you know, this is your class. Mate. This is your classmate, and we learn in Emmanuel Alexander. Are you together there? So, what is that? That is unit of language groups in Eastern Africa. So, what is this word brought unit? What brought them unit? One is trade. One is trade. Trading, trade activities. For example, let me ask you something. Are you able to sell your cows to your enemy? Are you able to buy food from your enemy? No. So, since you cannot do it to your enemies, for, for you to do trade, for you to buy and sell your things and goods and services, you must be free. Friends. So trade uh -huh, made those people to have unit. Number two, in the marriage. In the marriage. Every writing. In the marriage. In the marriage means this community marrying from the other communities. Many families nowadays you find mother and the father, they are not with the same language group. You find a Kamba married by a Luo. You find a Choni married, married to Gikuyu. And a Gikuyu married to Saita. So what is that? That is what we call it. Inter-married. Wait. Don't be overtaken by things that do not make sense. I was just giving you an example of what is inter-marriage. And I know, as a right explanation, Vanessa has not known what is in the marriage. Vanessa, what is in the marriage? It is when a person marries from a different community. That is what you call intermarriage. They marry from your community. And you go and marry from the uh, community. That is intermarriage. Number three. Number three is a cultural interaction. Cultural interaction. Nowadays, Maasai invite people when they are having initiation ceremonies. And from that interaction, when they have their culture and interact with them, you are you feel proud of the master, isn't it? In a way that when you meet the master, you it's like you've met your friend, friend. Because one day they invited you to their ceremony, you ate together with them, you ate meat. Well, listen. 2016. I was in Kajiado. <laughs> Namanga. Listen carefully. Eh? People in that region, they only speak in Maasai. They only speak in Kiswahili when they are addressing you. Because you don't know Maasai. Now, one day, they were having, well, they were having a ceremony they call it Kutabulu. Now, that is when they slaughter goats and they celebrate together. together. When they slaughter goats and they don't boil, they, eh? they burn, they roast. When they roast them. Now, one of them came to me. I thought, 
mwalimuni. Niko mwalimu, e mwalimuni. Leo tuna leo tuna tuna tabu. So nimekualika tukakule nini? Yeah. Wait. Listen carefully. When I went there, the person who just meet is only one person. So what happens is you sit. Eh? You sit in a circle. In a circle. Then there is a person who is holding the meat, and there is another one who is cutting the meat. So he can't give you moving around. So when you get the meat, do what? Eat. You'll go around, continue coming back to you. So if you, do, if you cannot eat first, you'll find yourself with a large amount of meat. So the secret is, the moment you get it, do what? Put it in your mouth. You but they round, they go one round, they find you, you are through with that, you get another one. You get another one. You get another one. Wait, I understand what I'm saying. After that, the full that day I went home when I'm very full of me. It was roasted. Right. From that day, we became friends. Friend. We became what? Friends. Eh? Leian, Leian, Kirgo. Number four. It is education for all. Education for all. Now, I want you to, to see this. Wait, quiet. Education for all has given children opportunity to interact from children from different communities and the teachers from different communities. Trust me, if I may ask you, you have seen teachers almost from all communities. Yes. You have been taught by a Kamba, you have been taught by a Luo, you have been taught by a Choni, you have been taught by a Kuyakiko. Also, you have learned with children from all the communities. So what is that? Education for all. Next one is... Yeah. There is another one. <laughs> oh, wait. wait, I told you that is a community in South Africa. Eh? Now, can we go to page sixty one? Can we go to page sixty one? Are you there? Every learner go to page sixty one. Are you there? Can we look at number one? List the main language groups in Eastern Africa. Raise up your hands. List the main language groups in Eastern Africa. Uh, Bantu, Kushite, Nylon, Semites. Aye, now question number two. There is a table there. Can you match Bantu with a group that shows Bantu? Ibrahim, can you sit down? Page 61. Bantu can be matched with a group starting with which name? Is this group starting with Tigre? Or is this group starting with Nua? Wachaga? Or Romo? 
Which group is Bantu? Wachaga. Group together with Wachaga. Kushites? Kushites is the group starting with Oromo and Negara. Same is the group starting with Tigre, Makoko, Amara, Nubian, and the Nilots? Eh? Newer. Aye. Well, so you are going during your free time, eh? During your free time. Make sure you have done number four to number seven. Number four to number seven. I will mark that work on Saturday. I will mark that work on Saturday. Number four to number seven. I want you to do it by doing a lot of research on those questions. People, population distribution in Eastern Africa. What is population distribution in Eastern Africa? What is population? Population is the number of people living in that area. Eh? Population refers to the total number, total number of people living in that an area or in a particular in a particular place. Yeah. That is what we call population. The total number of people living in an area is population. Yes. Total number. Oh. Total number of people living in a particular place. Area. Number two, we have another term called population distribution. Population distribution. Population distribution. What is this? What is population distribution? Eh? Population distribution is how people are spread. People are spread in an area. It's how people are spread in an area. Then number three is population density. Population density. What is population density? What is population density? The number of people in a square unit. The number of people living in a square Sasa. Uh -huh. It was to number of people. Number of 
people per square. Per square. Area. Yeah, this is the total refers to total. Total number of people per square area. So we have three densities. We have three densities. Yeah, one, we have partly populated, populated density. Two, we have medium populated density. And then number three, we have densely populated density. We have densely populated density. Those are the three densities we have. So the area where there is very few people, we see that area is sparsely populated. Meaning, you can move distances before you reach to the next family. From one family to the next family is kilometers and then kilometers. That area is partly populated. Area that is medium populated is just area like Ukunda. Okay, not there at the town, but here. You, you find there is a family here. You walk some distance before you reach the next family. Some distance. But now there is densely. We are from this to this to this to this to this. To... We shall talk about it tomorrow. Eh? We shall continue from there tomorrow. Tomorrow. Have a nice day. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, How are you? to home tires. So before we begin, uh, before we begin, uh, I'll drag over your books. Sasha, step forward. Nasra, step forward. And um, Ibrahim. Anybody that is you? 
So the other time we were looking at uh, cooking equipment and uh, we looked at how to clean a gas cooker, how to clean an electric cooker and how to clean a charcoal jiggle. Yeah. So today we are looking at how to clean a stove and then uh, we are going to wind up with uh, how to clean a traditional fireplace. Then afterwards we will now have to go and do the practical activity in the kitchen uh, as I promised earlier. So, how many have come across a stove? How many have come across a stove? So, how do you clean it? Or you've never cleaned a stove. You normally just add paraffin, you continue cooking and cooking and cooking. Huh? So, you are supposed to do what? You are supposed to clean that stove. Okay? And how are you cleaning the stove? How do you clean a stove? Rabia. Huh? So she's saying by removing the, uh, the, the, the food that has dropped on top of the stove, which is very correct, isn't it? How else can you do that? How, how else can you clean a stove? By doing what? Yes? By, uh, by doing what? How, what? You're using soap, yes. But how are you going to use the soap whenever you are cleaning that stove? How are you going to use the tea brine? You have to be having a piece of cloth, okay? And you also have to be having a warmer soapy water that is used to wipe you run the the cloth in the water and then afterwards you do water use it to wipe and remember after wiping there has to come the rinsing has to come in isn't it <coughs> how do you rinse using what using another clean water the same round it is not soapy okay we are rinsing using clean warm water so a stove, one, you're going to have to need all those requirements that you want. Eh? Collect all the materials that you need. And some of the materials, we, we need a, a paraffin stove itself. We need a duster, warm water, a cleaning cloth, cleaning detergent, and older newspapers. Okay? Step number one, you have to protect the working area. You have to protect the working area. And uh, turn off the stove and let it cool down. After using it, you turn it off and allow it to cool down for the purposes of safety. And then dust off any loose data from the surface of the stove, the surface of the stove, where you are cooking the top part, or maybe where we are putting the paraffin, uh, it's normally the surface is larger than uh, the one that is molding the superior, isn't it? So the food droppings can be dropping down uh, so you have to do water, you have to dust off any loose dust that, that is there. And then using a cloth run from warm soapy water, clean the stove, burner, and the whole surface. A stove also has its burner, isn't it? So you have to clean it and also the whole surface. And afterwards, you rinse the stove with a cloth that is run from cleaner water, wipe it until it is dry using a dry piece of cloth. And then afterwards, you fill the stove with a paraffin up to two thirds. Are we together? Up to two thirds. Why are we not filling it completely? Why are we not supposed to fill a stove up to its full? We are we are just filling it up to three thirds. Why? Who can tell me why? 
Why are we just filling the the, uh, the, the stove using two thirds of the uh, the paraffin and not a full? We are not filling it to the full, the fullest. Why? Yes, Chelsea. Uh huh. To avoid fire outbreaks, and this one is as a result of an explosion. Are we together? Yes. So we fill it up to two thirds to avoid that explosion that can bring about a fire outbreak. Are we together? And then lastly, you do water, you wash, dry, and clean the materials that you have used and store them in a dry place. So as you can see, all these processes are almost at the same. Okay. But then the difference comes where, where, whereby we are, use, we, are, we are now using a different cooking equipment and therefore the requirements are going to be different on the cooking equipment itself, okay? And then the source of fuel that is being used. If it is a gas cooker, you are going to turn off water, the gas, isn't it? If it is an electric cooker, you are going to turn off the electricity. If it is a stove, we are going to do what? We are going to, what are you going to do with a stove? You turn off the stove, isn't it? But then remember, the fuel that is being used there, it is a paraffin. Are we together? So the only difference it is the sources of uh, the type of fuel that is being used, and also the mode of uh, the materials that we are needing in terms of uh, the cooking equipment themselves. Are we together? But all the other things, if it is warm soapy water, we are using all uh, in all the cooking equipment all across warm soapy water. We wash. We rinse and we dry. And after everything is done, we clean all the materials that we have used and then we store them in a dry place. Okay? Yes. Then now when you go to the traditional uh, fireplace, this is where we are using firewood as our source of fuel, isn't it? So when you're using firewood, one, the materials that are needed, it is, uh, what do we need? Remember when you're using firewood, there is ash that is going to be formed, isn't it? So we are going to be needing like a piece of stick to remove the ash. Why? Because we cannot use our bare hands for the purpose of safety, isn't it? What else are we going to need? Uh -huh. We are going to need a broom. We are also going to need uh, we are also going to need old newspapers, isn't it? Yes. So one, we need a broom. We need an old newspaper. We need a brush and a dustpan. This is when we are using a traditional fireplace. So a traditional fireplace is different from water from the Jiko. This is because at this point now we are using the ground. Okay, we are using the three stones, and then uh, we now use the we use firewood to make water our cooking equipment. So the first method is the first the first thing to do is to collect all the materials that you need. Then secondly, put out the fire. Put out the fire before starting. The, pro, the cleaning process because you cannot clean that place if the fire is still burning. Why? So that you don't you don't uh, you don't burn yourself. Okay. Then secondly, you remove any dirt on the three stones using a brush. Use the broom to sweep the fireplace and uh, collect the dirt using the dust pan. And the dust pan should it be a plastic one? Should it be a plastic one? No. no. It shouldn't be a plastic one because it's going to end up burning. We have those that are metallic. So it is advisable to use the metallic one. Okay? Yes. Then the ash can be used to preserve cereals or applied on garden soil. And also it can be used as a, in the compost pit and also in the pit latrines. Remember we said in the pit latrines, the ash is used to do what? The ash is used to? To kill the maggots, are we together? So instead of disposing it in a compost pit, you can improvise it if it is necessary. Are we together? And then afterwards, you clean up and store the materials that you have used in a dry place. Are we together? But why do we do all this? Why do we have to clean all these cooking equipment that we are using? Why? Yes, Chelsea? To avoid getting diseases. One is to avoid getting diseases. So, cleaning first it is part of hygiene, isn't it? So, for you to, to be hygienical, you're supposed to be maintaining cleanliness everywhere. From the kitchen equipment 
from the cooking equipment, even from the working area that you are, the kitchen itself. So all that it was to make us maybe to avoid to avoid getting here, getting diseases, to kill germs, isn't it? To make the place look presentable, isn't it? So those are some of the things why the reasons as to why we clean. The cooking, uh, the cooking equipment equipment is also going to last for a long period of time if it is maintained and if it is well kept. Hygiene is also enhanced and then bad smell. We are going to prevent bad smell whenever we are cleaning our kitchen equipment. And if you are, if you are avoiding the bad smell, the pests are, going, are not going to be there, isn't it? The house fly. The house fly is not going to be running around our kitchen area if the place is a Lena. Remember, those are some of the animals uh, and insects that normally bring germs to our food. And at the end of the day, we might end up uh, contracting diseases like uh, typhoid, isn't it? The rare, isn't it? So, maintaining a cleaner environment for working in the kitchen helps us to maintain our health standards. Then it ensures safety while we are cooking. How are we going to ensure our safety whenever we are cooking? If you're having a cleaner, a cleaner cooking equipment. How are we going to ensure our safety? Hmm? How are we going to ensure our safety? Let's assume you are using an electric cooker and then there are maybe a spillage of some liquid on the electric cooker. And remember, electricity and liquids, they don't go hand in hand, isn't it? So you can end up being getting water and electric shock. Why? Because you have not maintained a very clean and unconducive environment for you to work in the kitchen. Are we together? Yes. So that marks the end of our topic about cleaning kitchen, equi cooking equipment. And let us write about uh, the fireplace and the stove before we move on to our next subtopic.
you are storing the paraffin okay so if you are storing this paraffin let's assume we've kept it in a in a bottle uh the sprite bottle and the paraffin is colorless itself isn't it what happens if someone comes by he or she is going to think that this is soda and they may end up taking the paraffin thinking that it is a soda so make sure that at all times whenever you are doing uh, the, the transferring of the paraffin from the stove, make sure that it is water the bottle is labeled okay for safety purposes Are we all done writing the first part? Yeah. Everyone is yeah. done writing the first part, right?
You are going to write about um, benefits of caring for cooking equipment, and I need you to write for me five benefits. So, after you're done writing this, you write the subtopic there benefits. Benefits of caring for. <laughs> Cooking equipment. Benefits of caring for cooking equipment. So, you write five benefits. We've already discussed about them. So, you're going to write the five benefits. And then, uh, when we'll be meeting in our next lesson, we'll now be looking at a new strand where we'll be looking at uh, planning a family meal or planning meals for a family. Considering all the things that we've been looking at whenever we are looking, we are looking at food and nutrition, uh, about the nutrients that are needed in the body, and then uh, using those nutrients, we now have to plan for a family meal that uh, contains all the nutrients, isn't it? And uh, a meal that contains all the nutrients, what do we say? What do we call such kind of a meal? It is a balanced diet. So when we'll be coming to this uh, topic, I will need us to be to cooperate so that we do all the this topic well. And then uh, before that, we are also going to be uh, uh, we are also going to the kitchen to do a practical activity on how to clean a traditional fireplace and how to clean a charcoal jiko. Are we together? The other cooking equipment, the uh, the electric burner and the gas cooker, uh, the electric cooker and the gas cooker. This is a practical activity that you should do at home, okay? Yes. But then for the others, you can do it here at school. And then uh, we now go to the topic of planning meals for a family.
So we'll meet tomorrow and you have a good evening.